Hi, I'm Bernadette and welcome to Confessions of a Marketing Mind. I'm joined here today by Cynthia Deeran. Welcome. Hey Bernadette, uh, great to be on the show. Um, lovely, um, it's great to have you Cynthia. Could you share a bit more about yourself to everyone? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm the founder and managing director of Deeran & Associates and we help companies to scale internationally and to amplify their impact in the world. Amazing. Uh, well, I think that's very prevalent for today is a lot of businesses are planning what 2021 looks like. Um, so I'm really keen to dive in. But first of all, I have one big question that we ask everyone. What is the geekiest thing about you? Well, a lot of people don't know that I speak Arabic and French. And, um, you know, sometimes in my travels, I come across words I don't know in Arabic and French. So I look them up in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that you know so many different languages. How many years has it taken you to learn each language? Uh, quite a lot. So I started okay. learning French when I was 12. Okay. Um, I learned Japanese in there for a while, but I've pretty much forgotten that from not using it. Yep. <laughs> and I learned Arabic as an adult. So I learned it when I was about 25. Uh, and I did nothing but that for about a year. That's so, amazing. yeah. Oh, that's a little while. <laughs> that's a very cool geeky thing to have. Thank you. Yep. Um, amazing. So let's dive in. Um, I think one of the biggest questions that's always on everyone's mind is uh, this year in particular, more than anything, the digital marketing landscape is changing. Yeah. Um, so what are the biggest things that you've seen that have affected businesses and how they're approaching their growth from now until forever? So, look, I mean, I think in one sense, it's a really fractured landscape. So there are a lot of options out, out there and that can be quite uh, confusing for companies that don't have a big focus on marketing and don't have much depth in that area mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's also an area it's just it's evolving so rapidly mm -hmm. and so the options that are popping up and multiplying just keep multiplying you know faster and faster and even the way that the different platforms work changes continuously and so I think that can be a real challenge mm -hmm. For companies going global because not only do they need to learn the new market they're going into not only do they have to work out a marketing strategy but they have to keep up with the evolution of the platform pretty much on a weekly basis yep. um, so a really key example of that is the way that LinkedIn suppresses posts if you put a link into a post in LinkedIn mm -hmm. and it directs the the user off the platform LinkedIn will actually suppress that post and if you do it enough times it puts you in jail now the vast majority of people don't know that. Yep. Uh, and so they might be happily posting away, putting links into posts, and then wondering why they're getting no result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting how little um, organic traction that a lot of people can get these days on social platforms. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's more often talked about. And quite often the advice that you do get is share lots of links, share lots of posts. Yeah. Um, but somehow that's actually counterintuitive just because of how it's changing. And I think that is because it's changing. Because if you look at what you could do on Facebook, or LinkedIn, yep. or Instagram, mm -hmm. even five years ago, it was a totally different story. Yeah. So you could put a post out there and if you had enough people, you could get 20, 30,000 likes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a lot harder to do. I mean, we post three times a week mm -hmm. and on average for a post of mine, we might get two, three, four, six thousand, mm -hmm. but the days of 20 and 30,000, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're Guy Kawasaki or somebody like that, it's much harder to do. <laughs> Yeah, it's incredible. Just that pay to play environment, yeah. realistically, for a lot of businesses, but also not being able, not understanding potentially those changes to then leverage what is working on LinkedIn, like LinkedIn Pulse, yeah. I know is something that's much, a, much more of a bigger thing these days as well. Yeah. Um, so in terms of this year, have you seen any great examples of businesses going global? Yeah, I mean, look, we, that is what we do. We work with mm -hmm. businesses that are going global. So we are still seeing companies take on the challenge to go global. Um, you know, we've got a software company that we're working with that is going into Asia. We've got a manufacturing company that sells to 35 countries and has offices in Australia and the States. Mm -hmm. They started the year thinking that they were going to nosedive. Their business has come out doing better this year than it has last year. Mm -hmm. um, we're working with a defence company out of the US to go into Asia. Yeah, I mean, you're still seeing that trend continue. Yeah. Uh, some people have pulled back from it because they can't deal with the uncertainty mm -hmm. in the global landscape that, mm -hmm. that COVID has caused. Yeah, exactly. But a lot of companies have taken the attitude that crisis is really opportunity mm -hmm. and that now's a great time to get out there. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think it almost runs counter to what most people think is just uncertainty means 
no action or just wait and see and wait yeah. and see. But as we can always tell in these kinds of scenarios, you may end up waiting a very long time before you get any sense of certainty. So what does it look like for the businesses you have worked with to create that sense of a game plan, an action plan and pivot continuously? Yeah, look, I think it's um, that planning process is just as important as the plan itself. Mm -hmm. So the plan is important, but when things are evolving so quickly, it's almost inevitable that you are going to have to tweak it mm -hmm. as you go. But if you don't have something to start with, mm -hmm. you're at sea. So you've got nothing to benchmark against. So we really stress that people need to set a big picture vision. They need to work backwards. They need to create goals. And then underneath that, they need to have... Um, a series of 120 day action plans. So three 120 day action plans for the year. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are working on those continuously. Mm -hmm. And you know, those are the key things they're focusing on in the business when it comes to the international piece. And they're really checking back every month to say, how are we going against the action plan? Is this working? If it's not working, why not? Let's take it apart. Mm -hmm. Is it something about our execution or is something in the landscape changed? And we actually need to tweak up what we're doing uh, so that it responds to the conditions better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of this year, what's been your favourite example of a business pivoting really successfully? Ooh, um, that is a really good question. I'm just trying to think about that. One of the companies that we've done a little bit of work with is in the cheese and spirit space. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the year, they did a short pivot into hand sanitizer oh, yes, because yeah, they're yeah. making spirits. So, you know, they Obviously. could make hand sanitizer. Yeah. And that got them through a really tough part of the year. Mm -hmm. But now uh, they've pretty much dumped that again because they've mm -hmm. said, well, hand sanitizer has been taken by other big players. Yes. Uh, our market's coming back. So we've used that to get us through the rough patch. We're now going to go back to doing what we do best, Amazing. cheese and spirits. Yeah, which yeah. everyone loves this time of year. You really can't go wrong with no, no cheese and spirits. So. <laughs> so look, that would be one example of a company that's pivoted really well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in where we're taking companies international we're not really looking for them to pivot mm -hmm. we're looking for them to take what they do well and run with that find a way to make it work in that specific market yeah yeah and you know the starting point is really to go in with the product that you're going to have to alter the least mm -hmm. because there are a lot of variables when you go to a new market so what you want to do is take a product or a service that you mm -hmm. have that you know does really well in your existing markets mm -hmm. and you want to put it into into the new market with an absolute minimum of changes because every time you make changes, that's going to create a lot more work. Yeah, that's a really interesting point I hadn't thought about in terms of minimal changes because every time you make a change, you want new processes, your team yeah. has to think about ways of pivoting production lines or yeah. workflows on how you deliver that service. Is there a really great example you have of that, of a company that's gone in and, and had to make those big changes? Or... Oh, I'm just trying to think. No, because I, look, I can't really think of one because we really usually discourage it. Yeah. I mean, there are going to be examples um, and it won't be a, an our client example, but uh, let me give you, uh, I'll give you an example, you know, a famous brand example. So McDonald's is a company that's done it really well. Mm -hmm. It's got a global brand name, yes. but it has tweaked its menus for every single market that it's gone into mm -hmm. because uh, people have very you know, different yeah. parts in different countries. So Especially one of the fun things are going to another country and traveling and seeing what they have in their Macca's menu. Yeah, so you know, if you um, go to... It's a lot of fun. <laughs> you, go, you go to France and you can get a bottle of, a half bottle of red wine with your... Oh, that's lovely. With I your didn't know that. Yeah. Pounder, um, they have, you know, lots of vegetarian burgers if you go to India because the Hindu part of the population doesn't eat beef. So that's a company, you know, as I say, not one of our clients, but that's a company that's done a really great job at going in, taking its yes. basic offering and tweaking it up so that it actually matches mm -hmm. what the market's looking for. Coke is another great example. Again, mm -hmm. oh, love, it. love it if they'd be a client of ours and not a client of ours. But, you know, they, we'll put the word out. Yeah, we'll put the let, word let them know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Coke, Coke tastes slightly different oh, in a range of markets because people perceive taste flavor, differently. Flavour, sweetness. Yeah how carbonated it is. Yeah, yeah. so you, know, um, you see a lot in the food space. That's awesome. Um, I think one thing I'm really interested about is potentially talking about your own experiences yeah. in terms of launching globally yeah. and launching in the first place as well. What were the marketing strategies, approaches that you found really helpful early on? Uh, I think a little, a little early on when you're a startup and you don't have a lot of 
uh, resources behind you. I, an approach that I found really helpful, and look, I still recommend this to clients that do have money. I get them to try and uh, expand their thinking around this by saying, let's try and imagine what this would look like if you had no money. How would we go about doing this? And then so you build it as though you had no money and you think of ways to, to do it and then you kind of build it out with some money as opposed to doing what a lot of people do, build a very flashy marketing campaign and then work backwards and budget it out and then say, oh, it's going to cost 50000 We don't have the money to execute that. that on a, yeah. So, I mean, I love, yeah. um, in the early stages, I love doing things that are a little bit more personal. So I love referrals. Mm -hmm. I love partnerships. And if you can get partnerships right, you can get great leverage out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I love personalized gifts mm -hmm. and I love events. So mm -hmm. I did a workshop with a client yesterday where we talked about going into Asia. Mm -hmm. They're not a massive company. They're not teeny, teeny, tiny, but they're not huge. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to throw a huge amount of marketing budget at their Asia expansion yet because they're not sure what's going to work. It's early days. Yeah. Yes. It's and so we yeah. said, well, you've got to talk to senior decision makers. So we're probably not going to be, you know, we're not going to be going down the Instagram or Facebook route. Mm -hmm. That's not where it's at. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking to CEOs, CFOs, COOs in the manufacturing space because you're making forecasting software for mm -hmm. that sector. So what would, what do we think would work? So we talked that through and we came up with a plan for them to run three marketing events every 120 days mm -hmm. uh, in a couple of cities in Asia for next year. And that will be, um, each of those events will be, you know, fairly intimate, mm -hmm. 20 people maybe, mm -hmm. probably a boardroom around a meal, a chance for real conversation. So I guess what I'm saying here is looking for ways in the first instance to build, build real relationship mm -hmm. with people who you want to work with. Mm -hmm. It makes most sense, especially because it, it sounds like you've really factored in who that target market is, because if that target market gels much better in terms of face-to-face -face conversations yeah. as well, um, that's where the real opportunity is. Look, and I, I, think, I think that's key, and I always like to take, I think one thing that ugh, is really confusing for companies is if they're not from a marketing background, whoever's running the company or the top few executives look at it and they say, this marketing thing, I don't know, it's just this sea of confusing stuff, to, what, are we supposed to use LinkedIn or... Oh, we're supposed to do a Twitter campaign. I've heard this. I've Would heard it be, that. Yeah, TikTok yeah. videos. Or should somebody jump out of an aeroplane and we'll film it? And hopefully, <laughs> go, you know, what should we'll the thing viral. be? We'll go viral. And I like to say, look, let's just put all that aside for the moment. Let's look at the marketing triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can just think of a triangle, you know, on, on one side, you've got um, the market. And that's really about working out who is our ideal client. Mm -hmm. You know, who is the person that we really want to be talking to, mm -hmm. who really needs what we have, you know, whose who's problems we can really solve and getting a really good lock on that. Because then that will tell you a couple of things. It will tell you what should the message be? So what should be, what should you be saying? What's going to resonate? And then what's the method? You know, what's going to speak to that person? Mm -hmm. So if you're talking to a top exec, you know, again, to go back to this manufacturing example from a large Asian manufacturing company, mm -hmm. are they going to buy your product through a series of Facebook ads? Eh, you know, probably not. Oh um, but we've got another client, which is a manufacturer mm -hmm. and, you know, digital marketing is perfect for those guys. Mm -hmm. um, they are selling across the United States, for example. Uh, they're selling to wholesalers increasingly. They're selling direct. They don't need to be having one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with senior execs. Mm -hmm. They're targeting the middle of an organization and sometimes even the lower levels of an organization. Mm -hmm. And it's really all about what's the result that you can get with this product pretty much instantaneously, mm -hmm. uh, digital is perfect for them. Mm -hmm. And the use of, because of what their product does and the way that it, it creates a transformation instantaneously, video is great because they can actually demonstrate with a video or even this year um, with live stream, mm -hmm. they can demonstrate what the product does. So they used to do all their marketing through, through trade shows up until the start of this year. So they would spend a quarter of a million dollars every year traveling the world, going to trade shows, schlepping around. A lot around, of businesses. Yep, yeah, with their banners <laughs> and stuff. And then suddenly COVID hit and they're like, oh. What do we do now? Are we going to go yeah. under? We don't have any way to market. But they have taken that quarter of a million dollars and they have essentially turned part of their uh, office space into a live stream studio. Mm -hmm. And they have made the same sales this year that they did last year. That's uh, incredible. Live streaming. <laughs>
Um, I think a lot of other businesses have experienced that same transformation just yeah. purely from the fact that events are just a no-go for this year. And there's yeah. obviously a lot of virtual events, a lot of webinars that people are throwing, but at the same time, that requires a lot of pivoting and potentially skills and marketing support that they weren't ready to execute on. And I think a lot of people are, a lot of people have told me, oh, we're just so sick of Zoom. And it's not a feeling I share. I love Zoom. I spend like <laughs> at least half my day every single day on Zoom. So for me, it's fine, but a lot of people don't feel that way. They find it very tiring. Mm. And so, okay, they'll spend some time on Zoom, but they don't want that to be their primary channel. And they don't, that's not how they want to consume marketing either. Mm. It's either uh, something in person or maybe it's something digital, but it's not 100% virtual. Yeah, some element of in-person kind of, I don't know, activity, connection, yeah. or even if it's not so much a big conference, but something a bit more intimate where you can yeah. actually get to know the other person. It's more about relationship building than another live stream. Yeah, or, yeah another live which, stream. <laughs> which it can work as always, but yeah, understanding the bigger picture yeah. of where everyone's at and where the market is at as well, because there is a lot of Zoom fatigue realistically. Yeah. In terms of different types of businesses, for example, B2B versus B2C, are there any big differences that you see in how they should plan their approach to launching globally? Slightly. So uh, when it comes to segmentation, you're using different criteria if you are selling to a company to if you are selling to an individual. So often B2C can be very unpredictable. So, you know, if somebody goes to sell a dress, for example, the range of factors that go into a buying decision around a dress is much less predictable than, for example, the range of um, factors that go into a buying decision around a photocopier. Mm. So on one hand, B2C is more unpredictable and I think you've got to get a very, very clear lock on um, what's driving the buying decision for the individual lady who is you know, going to purchase that dress. Mm. With B2B, in some ways it's simpler because you can go through and you can segment by, you know, uh, industry, company size, mm -hmm. revenue, is it um, sort of d growing, um, maturing, declining, mm -hmm. what problems is it solving, is there a focus on sustainability, you know, depending on the thing that you're selling. Mm -hmm. Where the complexity comes in is that um, with a B2C customer, you are selling to a person. Mm -hmm. With a B2B customer, you are often you are selling to an organisation, but that's often five or six people. It's a lot of decision makers within that organisation. It is, yeah. and each one is going to have a different perspective. So, you know, mm -hmm. what the head of HR wants from a product is different mm -hmm. to what the CFO wants, mm -hmm. is different to what the COO wants, mm -hmm. is different to what the CRO wants. And you have to find a way of creating messaging that's going to speak to all of those. Mm -hmm. And I think that's often where people come unstuck. Mm -hmm. uh, because they do messaging, they create messaging that's going to work for one part of the organisation but not the rest of it yep. and so they then can't actually get that buying decision mm -hmm. uh, to go in their favour. So um, in terms of approach, I think, you know, as I say, B2C, get a very clear lock on the person that you mm -hmm. are going to make your pitch to and with B2B, get a very clear picture of the organisation that you're going to pitch to and then within that, focus on the different roles that you're going to need to sell to. So it's, look, unfortunately, it's a really involved process. And I think people often get put off by that because they look at it and they say, oh, this is so much work. You know, how are we going to invest all this work in mapping all this stuff out? But if you don't, mm -hmm. you risk not making the sale. So it's a choice yeah. between putting in the work and increasing the likelihood of getting the sale yep. or Definitely. glossing over it, you know, taking the lazy approach, winging it and missing out. Yeah, I think quite often um, that's probably, in terms of winging it, that's probably where people have a lot of gut instinct about what yeah. sells. But that closing the loop and validating whether your gut instinct is actually correct yeah. or maybe there's that refinement that needs to happen in terms of documenting and understanding your end target customer, that's the missing link. Look, I think so because you can, what a lot of businesses do is they come up with this generic avatar of who they're going to sell to. And they say, oh, it's this avatar. And it's actually not. It's an avatar that they've come up with and it doesn't reflect a real person. Mm -hmm. And the avatar that they've created, you know, on the back of a beer coaster at the pub, uh, isn't a real person. And you can't sell to somebody who isn't yeah. a real person. Yeah. Uh, so I find that people are much better served by actually doing that work mm -hmm. of crafting their avatar based on the data they've got about their mm -hmm. clients and 
uh, interviewing clients and finding out, using the client's own words to actually reflect what's required. Mm -hmm. So, you know, listening to your customer. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty basic concept. Seems step one thing. A lot of people, a lot of people skip it. It's so it. crucial. A lot of people mm. skip it because it's not sexy, mm -hmm. and you know, frankly, it's a bunch of effort to do. Mm. And there are other things that people feel they'd be better yeah. spending their time on, but um, look, that doesn't tally with reality in my experience. Yep. And I love that approach because coming down to the simple fact of what are they experiencing in, and in their own words, yeah, how are they articulating their problems? Because. I know that from experience, understanding pain points, it's what really, really gets them each day, what makes their life difficult, what challenges them. That's the stuff that they feel the need to then solve. And yeah. so being able to articulate that in their own, in your customer's words, sorry, um, that's where the real opportunity is. Well, people buy things to solve problems, mm -hmm. even if they don't consciously think about that. So mm -hmm. if you cannot identify and solve the key problem for your client, you are not going to make a sale. And you know, in an international context, what that is actually might be slightly different market to market. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, you know, I've got an example. Um, there's a company based here in Sydney called Minnow Designs and it makes mm -hmm. swimmable footwear for children. So mm -hmm. in other words, reef shoes for babies and toddlers. Mm -hmm. um, in Australia, this is a reef shoe, it's a beach shoe and people uh, use it and wear it at the beach. They distribute internationally though and they found that people photograph their little kids wearing mm -hmm. these Minnow Design shoes and they put them on Instagram and they've noticed that in other parts of the world, people aren't buying them for reef shoes, they're buying them for kids to wear inside oh. as kind of, you know, as slippers and comfy, yeah. fashionable shoes that are for slippers, which is not at all what they had in mind, but the problem that that shoe is solving in another part of the world is not the same problem as it's solving mm -hmm. here where kids are, you know, at the beach and in the rock pool all summer. Mm -hmm. That's amazing because then it probably speaks to the fact that there's a real opportunity there as well. That yeah. there's a problem that other companies maybe aren't solving as well and they could jump in and go hard on that area. They could, and I mean, maybe it's only a question of changing up the market. So you could alter the product, but as a first step, you could just tweak your marketing for that product mm -hmm. and you could sell it, you know, yeah. with a slightly <laughs> different twist. And then, okay, well, maybe we go on. And you know, I think these guys are probably already doing that. Mm -hmm. They're designing other uh, products that, around this, yeah. Yeah, that then speak to what people in other markets have reflected back to them about what they're using it for. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, I know so far we've covered a lot of marketing wins, a lot of fun success stories of how companies have pivoted. Yeah. I want to actually dive into potentially some stories about some mishaps that companies come along the way. What have been the, the stories of people learning it the hard way um, that you can share? So to protect identity of people, I will, <laughs> I will talk about examples that are already kind of in the public domain and re reasonably well known. But um, look, I mean, let's talk about a couple of cross-cultural stuff always brings up um, challenges mm -hmm. that people are not always aware of. So well, let me give you a few. So, you know, uh, the company UPS, which mm -hmm. does deliveries, their brand colors are gold and brown. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Back in the 90s, they're a Dutch company, but they decided they'd launch a few com uh, countries over in Spain. Mm -hmm. So they just went ahead and, you know, rolled it out, mm -hmm. put their brown trucks into Spain. They did not realize that in Spain, hearses are brown. Oh, no. And so suddenly it looks as though there's a bunch of like hearses yeah. with UPS on the side driving around. Um, they basically had to shut it down, pull it out, uh, redo the entire thing and go back in again. Mm -hmm. Uh, it cost them an absolute mozza. That's crazy. Um, another one was with, uh, I think it's Mitsubishi, which makes the Pajero, right? Mm. We all know the Mitsubishi Pajero, you know, a lot of, so no one would love car here in, here in Australia. Unfortunately, uh, and again, you know, this is another one where somebody launched into Spain and it didn't go so well. In Spanish, Pajero means wanker. Oh no. And so they <laughs> launched this car. <laughs> into Spain oh, okay. and suddenly wondered, you know, why uh, it wasn't selling very well. Mm. Again, no they, one wants to buy a car called no, a wanker. Pull, yeah, so they had to <laughs> pull it and redo it again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another great example, if you want a Middle Eastern example, um, I think it was McDonald's or I'm pretty sure it was McDonald's ran a campaign around the Big Mac mm. um, and it featured 
somebody eating a Big Mac with two hands. Now that sounds pretty innocuous, right? Mm. And they couldn't work out why the campaign just bombed, mm. generated nothing. And then an employee pointed out to them that um, essentially, you know, in um, the Islamic faith and in the Middle East in particular, your right hand is considered clean mm. and your left hand is for like personal hygiene. Mm. And so it's considered unclean. So you're only ever supposed to touch food with your right hand. So when people saw a Big Mac being held with two hands, that was extremely off-putting mm. for them. Um, no, no. You know, yeah. look, so th there are tons. Um, mm. Uh, for the Football World Cup mm -hmm. one year, um, Heineken decided that it would put a, you know, the flag mm -hmm. of each of the companies competing in the tournament under the lid of the, the beer cap, like yeah. on the down yeah. on the underside of the beer cap. So that was fine for most people, but um, unfortunately they forgot that alcohol is banned in Saudi Arabia oh. and they had the Saudi flag on the underside of the beer cap yeah. touching the beer. Now, that was an absolutely massive PR mm -hmm. disaster for them. Mm -hmm. um, look, Australia's had its own fair share of things that have gone wrong. So I don't know if you remember that Laura Bingle tourism campaign oh, about where the bloody hell are you? Yep. Everybody here thought that was like hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When it went to the UK, when it went to the United States, people are actually quite offended. Really? And they just yeah, thought, this is like, why is this funny? This is not good. Tourism Australia had to scrap that entire mm -hmm. campaign. Mm -hmm. So look, those are examples that are in the public domain, but there are lots of examples in the international marketing space where mm -hmm. things have gone wrong because people didn't do their research, mm -hmm. people did not talk to people in the market and seek feedback, mm -hmm. and people got lazy and assumed that they could copy and paste whatever they'd done at home mm -hmm. into the new market and that it would work the same way. And it doesn't work the same way because people are different everywhere. Mm -hmm. You can't just copy paste and assume the same results are going to come you out. You cannot. Of something. Look, even Australia to New Zealand, you're going to find different, mm. different experiences. I think even for um, our own experience as well, and for clients as well, just even state to state or city to city, there's just an element of research and preparation that needs to go in before yeah. you just dive in. It won't necessarily land the same way. Won't be exactly the yeah. same. And you know, the difference, the 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 more different the culture, the bigger the gap is going to be. Mm -hmm even in terms of what channels you can use and what channels people will appreciate. So a really, really obvious example is in China. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an Australian company might think, oh, we've done so well with Facebook marketing, we're just going to run that again in China. Well, sorry, guys, it's not going to work. a problem There's, there. <laughs> yeah, no, no Facebook available in China. Yeah. You'll need to, okay, you can definitely have a digital strategy and you should because mm -hmm. everything, including, I mean, China's pretty much entirely paperless and everything is done through WeChat. But if you're going to run your marketing campaign, it needs to be uh, one that's built for yeah, that's those cool. channels and also yeah. so just for the sensibilities of the Chinese consumer. Mm -hmm. So whereas here we tend to sell on features and benefits and results, mm -hmm. a lot of their aspirational marketing is a lot of their marketing in China is very aspirational. Mm -hmm. So do you, I don't know if you would be old enough to remember um, back in the 80s there was a Coke ad with a lot of people kind of um, bouncing in a ginormous beach ball around. It was I don't all about remember it, but Coke I feel like it's a very similar theme to yeah. the ads. <laughs> Coke kind of, you know, Coke still sort of sells on aspiration. Yeah. That's very yeah. much the style of um, thinking and marketing that people like in China. It's all about, you know, who is this going to make me if I consume mm -hmm. this product? Not I want to so be much. that person. Yeah, not so yeah. much. It's not so much here are the features and benefits and here's the result that you're going to get. Mm. Yeah, That's really interesting. I love all those examples. I think the best place to start quite often is just on what not to do. Yeah. Don't jump in without checking first, doing your research. Keep a plan in place. See what's actually worked potentially for other competitors in that yeah. space and, and learn from them and, and learn from what they've learned from the hard way as well. I guess I'd love to explore more some more personal examples from your clients, from your personal experience as well. Um, do you have any favorite examples of clients who've done the research and potentially skipped some of those hurdles along the way because of um yeah doing all the work up front yeah look um one company that we worked with and this is you know quite incredibly they were a very young company so it's an engineering consulting firm mm -hmm. they uh came to us when they were only about two years old and said, oh, we want to go into six markets in Asia. And I went, no, no, that's a terrible idea. Let's just pick one mm -hmm. and start with that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, and I have to say up front, they were not heavily into the digital marketing space um, because of what they do. So they took a more relationship 
based approach, but because the company was run by engineers, mm -hmm. very much about following the process. Mm -hmm. and so they followed the process and they, they checked in with us at every stage. So every time they were about to do something, they'd come and say, we're thinking of doing this. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a good way? And we would work through, you know, some different options for how they could do it well. Mm -hmm. Because they really followed a structure, within four months they'd made their first international sale mm -hmm. and their first international client was DHL. Mm -hmm. And then the next month um, they got Unilever. Amazing. And then within a year they'd managed to actually set up a, a hub in Singapore mm -hmm. and run a partnership with a major multinational mm -hmm. Um, logistics firm mm. uh, and so that is you know that's an example that I really like because they got some wins in a very short space of time and they didn't do anything super super fancy mm. you know it was quite quite personalized mm. uh, so that is one that I really really like uh, you know another one that I like uh, we had a client that went to the Hong Kong market and they are in the charity marketing space mm. So they represent a lot of the big charities here and they realised that there was a blank spot in the market in Hong Kong. Nobody was really doing marketing specifically for charities and it's a very specific, you know, the messaging and the techniques that you actually get, need to deploy to get people to donate to charities are sort of different to what you use for anything else. Um, again, they did not do, they did use some digital marketing, but again, they didn't do anything huge and flashy, mm -hmm. but they tested and measured and in a pretty short space of time, they were able to, you know, secure some key clients up there mm -hmm. and get a foothold in the market, mm -hmm. even without having a full-time office presence up there. And it's mm -hmm. just about being structured about it, mm -hmm. you know, really thinking through what you're going to do and then testing and measuring, testing and measuring, testing and measuring. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't test and measure because, yeah. again, you know, it's kind of a drag. You have to put the num yeah. You have to yeah. put the numbers together. You need to look at them frequently. Mm -hmm. But I find um, the people that get results are the ones that commit to massive action mm -hmm. and are consistent about it over time. Mm -hmm. So you know this is not a five minute process. You don't wake up one morning and say oh, we're going to go global, mm -hmm. and then three months later suddenly you're an international brand. Mm -hmm. You have to say this is probably going to be a minimum three year process. Mm -hmm. We're going to commit to it. We're going to give bandwidth to it. We're going to dedicate some people who will spend at least part of their time just on this and then we're just going to chip away at it mm -hmm. because basically it's like starting your company up all over again mm -hmm. in it's a, a fresh completely start. different place <laughs> as you know as I think you guys probably know. Yeah I, I love that point um, ultimately for a lot of businesses maybe one of the assumptions they make is assuming something can happen overnight or in yeah. the next six months or in the next year even then 12 months might not be enough to really give um, this global expansion a good shot um, and on that note as well the biggest question is how much time should I be putting in how much money should I be putting in yeah so before you answer any of those questions obviously the question is about ROI yeah um, about how many customers the cost of a customer acquisition the conversion rate and all those things yeah. what have been your experiences of helping um, companies realize those numbers and identify the core numbers before they actually make any big decisions. Oh, look, we do it. We try and encourage people to do it whenever they're designing mm -hmm. their entire strategy. So, I mean, it applies for marketing, but it applies for pretty much every aspect of uh, taking a business international. Uh, and every time somebody comes to me, you know, it happened yesterday, um, I had a workshop with a client and they said, so we want some help around this aspect of marketing. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, that's really good. But before we dive into the weeds on what you're going to do, what's the revenue you want from your international markets next year? And they said, we want this number. And then they thought about it a bit more and said, oh, okay, so this market will generate this much, this market will generate this much, and then the rest, you know, these bunch of other markets will also generate a bunch of money. Okay, well, that's good, because then we know how we're going to allocate our priorities. Mm -hmm. And then we said, all right, well, how many projects will you need to deliver that revenue? Mm -hmm. So we talked through the projects. How many leads are you going to need mm -hmm. to actually deliver that many projects? So then we had a number of leads. I think we came up with we'd need 40 leads to generate the revenue that they had in mind. Okay, so if we're going to get 40 qualified leads and we want to use a very personalised approach, what do we need to do? And essentially what we did was not complicated, but we worked thoroughly backwards from where, what we are trying to achieve mm -hmm. to then discover what we should do. And I think that's something that people often miss because they get an idea 
in mind about what they're going to do or they see what somebody else is doing mm -hmm. and they think, oh, great, bright, shiny, you know, I don't know, we'll do an Instagram campaign or mm -hmm. we'll do this thing or that thing or, you know, we'll put iPhones in the blender and blend them up and it will work. <laughs> But they don't, they don't really think about what, uh, whether that's going to deliver what they need. So I think you know, how you arrive at what you are going to do has got to be driven by what you plan to achieve and the resources you've got to throw at it. Mm. And I think you know, that rigour in terms of thinking and numbers is really important, mm. but it gets skipped mm. quite often. Yeah, and I mean, all those questions are so crucial. I can imagine if you are, if you do have a, a goal of generating X amount of revenue, yeah. just doing that reverse engineering process yeah. of do we actually have the funds, the time, the people to deliver on that amount, yeah. that revenue figure, essentially. Um, in terms of um, your experiences with other businesses, what are the biggest, what are the most common figures that people overlook in terms of their importance? Uh, conversion ratios. Okay. At different parts of the funnel, mm -hmm. um, number of leads required. I think it's just it's not joined up mm -hmm. quite often. So people will have a revenue figure at one end of the spectrum, and then a, sort of a series of marketing actions that they're going to mm -hmm. carry out. Mm -hmm. But that entire process is not looked at. So people are not sitting down and looking at that customer journey, and. Mm -hmm looking at where the holes are mm -hmm. because you know it can be really common that some companies have got heaps of leads but almost no clients mm -hmm. but if you say well where is it breaking down in the funnel they're not really sure mm -hmm. or you've got the reverse problem where the bottom of the funnel is converting really well and people say well you know once we get to this uh i don't know sort of uh, initial meeting that we do or we do this uh, audit for our clients and this identifies a bunch of problems mm -hmm. once we've they've done the audit we pretty much know they're going to become a customer mm -hmm. But the lead flow is horrendous mm. and their cash flow is lumpy because they're getting two projects a year. Mm. Uh, and what they haven't done is gone back and really identified where in the process it's breaking down. Mm. And then to take that part of the process apart and tinker with it like you would with the engine in a car until it actually works. Mm. It's as though they almost say, oh, engine's not working. We'll just throw that engine out and buy a new one. <laughs> get a new car. Yeah. Well, we're at it. <laughs> and you know, if you're going to do that with your car, it's pretty expensive. Uh, it's really expensive to do that with your marketing as well. Yeah. Uh, and that can break your business pretty much. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the bigger the opportunity as well, the bigger the risk. So making sure you have that funnel in place, a building out a clear funnel and knowing what those conversion rates yeah. are. Um, and also being able to identify then, well, now you've got a funnel, where is it leaking? Which at some point, there's always going to be a leak. Um, maybe there's not as much nurturing through that middle of funnel so yeah. that you're, you're getting a bunch of leads, but they're not turning into opportunities. Or maybe so you're churning before. clients because what they experience in the sales process yeah. does not match up with what they experience once yeah. they become a client. So they feel a lot of love before they become a client and then they become a client and they just get ignored. So Yeah, yeah. and ultimately it's, it's not always a big thing that might make or break, but little friction points and accumulation yeah. of all, all of those things. Amazing. Uh, so Cynthia, one of the things I love asking is, have you found any unorthodox marketing strategies that have worked over your time? Look, I don't know how unorthodox it is, but uh, I like to personalize what we do to a really high degree because I think uh, you know, prospective clients are people at the end of the day mm -hmm. and people are much more likely to want to work with you if they think that you actually care about them. So, you know, gifts that are personalized just to the person. Mm -hmm. I think, again, you know, it's a bit of work, but it often, uh, I've, I think that can be really effective because it demonstrates that you took enough time to think about that person and what they really like. Um, we love to do in-person events as well. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we get a bunch of business owners in a room for a day and essentially we give them a slice of really great IP that we usually keep just for clients. Mm -hmm. And we do it for them at a nominal charge. And the goal there is really to, to get them in, to give them as much value as we can, mm. to make sure they have a fantastic experience and to show them, you know, if you want to come and work with us, this is what it's going to be like. Mm. Every single day that you work with us will be like this or even better. Mm. So I don't know how unorthodox that is, but that's something that we found really effective. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mentioned um, putting things in the blender before. Mm -hmm. It's not one that I have found effective because we don't sell a product, but um, there is a guy in the States who was 
selling blenders okay. and he was having a lot of trouble marketing the blender. And at some point he thought he would uh, make a video of him blending an iPhone mm -hmm. to show how effective this, this blender was. So he did. Uh, that went absolutely viral <laughs> and the blenders, you know, that blender chain or blender line of products has done very, very well. So that's something that's pretty unconventional, but look, I can't claim any credit for that one. I wouldn't try and replicate that at don't. home. Don't try this at home. We don't sell blenders. <laughs> that's definitely true. Uh, but I love those, both of those examples, I think. I mean, the first one, um, maybe it's unorthodox just in the sense that people quite often go for something flashy and on scale and viral yeah. when really quite often what will work best for your business, depending on your business, is thinking creatively on how to build relationships. Yeah. Be genuinely human and make that connection, which yeah. isn't always easy. Um, and it is, yeah, it's definitely putting in the hard yards in quite often. Um, and the second one, I wouldn't recommend it if, <laughs> unless you're a blender brand. Um, I freak out a little bit and I'm scared for my iPhone, but it, it's exciting to hear that it worked. And I guess, yeah, speaking to thinking creatively and out of the box that, you know, it's Look, and I work. think it's all often just not looking at what everybody else is doing and doing the same thing mm -hmm. because you know, there are a variety of marketing channels. And when, you know, if you're in a certain, let's say if you're in fashion mm -hmm. and everybody is advertising through Facebook, it's going to be effective for a time, but at a certain point, the market is going to be saturated. Mm -hmm. And what you can sometimes find is that if you do something that everybody else is not doing, mm -hmm you get noticed because it's different. Mm -hmm. So doing the same is often safe. Uh, it doesn't always generate the best results. I mean, sometimes an unorthodox thing can totally bomb. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, guerrilla marketing is not without risk. Mm -hmm. But this is where uh, I think it's really helpful to do the exercise of um, generating options for a bunch of channels mm -hmm. and then picking a maximum of three and running some short-term inexpensive tests and getting a sense of how things are going to work mm -hmm. and then throwing out the things that don't work so well mm -hmm. or that work partially and just drilling down and focusing on the thing that you can think is going to generate results mm -hmm. and becoming an absolute master at that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, okay, five years in, maybe it's not going to work anymore, but you will have actually maximised what you can get from that channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree on that point because ultimately there are a lot of fashion brands. There's a lot of, I don't know, food brands. There's yeah. so much out there. Um, and particularly with Facebook, just thinking about scrolling through, you're really bombarded with so many different ads. So really yeah. drilling into what's going to be the thing that makes you stand out is, yeah. yeah, so powerful. I know I've bought so many things because I found that they're all sustainable. I'm like, that's it. I'm yeah. buying that pair of shoes. And uh, even if it's more expensive, you know, you'll go all in on something that is unique and, and particularly people believe in as well. Absolutely. Um, uh, I have one last question. Thank you so much for your time already, Cynthia. Uh, I think this one goes out to all the senior marketers who are wanting to go global, but also pretty sh shaken and excited and confused by this entire year. What would be your biggest advice for all of those marketers? Do your homework, do your research. Don't be lazy and assume you can just copy paste whatever has worked at home because the odds are that it won't work exactly the same way. Um, Use what you've done as a foundation. Be, be ready to tweak it and customise it for the new place you're going to. Mm -hmm. Look at what your competitors are doing mm -hmm. and just test and measure, test and measure, test and measure. It might not be the sexiest answer, but it's the best answer ever because <laughs> ultimately, like we do, I think we have a saying in our office, the value is evidence on opinion. Yeah. Um, everyone will have an opinion about something and there's a good opinions quite often and they Sometimes your gut will lead you in a really great direction, but ultimately you need data to back it up. You need to do your groundwork and do the homework, totally. um, which you know you might not want to do, but <laughs> <laughs> it's worth um, it. <laughs> in the end, in the end. Cynthia, thank you so much for your time today. It's been amazing to chat with you about everything digital marketing and global expansion. Thanks for having me on the show. Amazing. Well, thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in. Um, for those of you through the camera, what are your tips about global expansion and doing it successfully online? Um, in the meantime, I hope to see you next time.